Our experience tells us that it is easier to balance on a bike when it is moving. In fact, the faster the wheels spin, the less you worry about trying to keep it balanced upright. A demonstration by Veritasium takes this spinning wheel to the gravity-defying level. Why wouldn't the gravity topple the spinning wheel, but instead undergoing the processional motion we see here? YouTube is a wonderful place full of these classroom demonstrations of angular motion. Here, why does the cage spin faster when contracted? What is the moment of inertia, and how can it explain this phenomenon? Going beyond the classroom, our Earth is a macroscopic spinning object with very interesting emerging phenomenon due to its angular motion. For example, do you know that hurricanes swirl clockwise in the southern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere? Going further out, you might have also heard of Jeff Bezos' vision of creating a giant centrifuge to produce artificial gravity for human inhabitation. It relies on the so-called centrifugal force. Why is the centrifugal force often called a fictitious force? The goal of this video is to present a unified way of understanding all these well-known phenomena related to angular motion in a physically transparent way, all done in a very concise and intuitive manner in less than 10 minutes. Together with Richard Feynman, as detailed in his classic lectures on physics, we will expose key concepts such as the angular momentum, torque, precession, moment of inertia, rotational kinetic energy, Coriolis, centrifugal, Euler, and centripetal forces, among others. So, let's begin. All angular motion boils down to Newton law of motion. Feynman began reminding us of the well-known Newtonian mechanics of point mass. For simplicity, let's constrain ourselves to just 2D. If its position r and velocity v is defined, in conjunction with the force f exerted on it, then one can map out the trajectory of point mass over time. The Newton's second law can also be casted in a different form, where force is expressed as the rate of change of linear momentum, here and denoted by p. However, unlike point masses, large objects in the world are more complicated. Such large objects can be imbued with internal degrees of freedom, allowing them to spin, precess, wobble, and so on. It might be hard to believe that only the Newton's second law is at work here. But that's what we will set out to do with Feynman. We begin by first defining an object known as a rigid body. A rigid body can be thought of as comprising of many elementary point masses, but the forces between them are so strong that the rigid body do not bend or deform. For a perfect circular rigid disk, the center of mass will then be at the center of the disk. Now suppose that the disk is stationary with respect to its center of mass and that it is constrained on the xy plane. Then there is only one thing left for it to do, that is to rotate. Using the right thumb rule convention, we can designate an axis of rotation for our anti-clockwise rotation, which is along the z-axis. The rate of angular rotation is typically denoted by the symbol omega. Omega can be written in vector form, where the unit vector z denotes the axis of rotation. Now we can zoom into one point particle here in the red particle and try to describe its dynamics in the presence of this angular motion. Simple trigonometry allow us to write down its xy coordinates. Its velocity components can then be expressed in terms of the angular frequency and the spatial coordinates as shown. In general coordinate system, one can show that the velocity of a point mass is given by the cross product between its position and the angular velocity. We highlight this result as we will make use of it later. To continue with the discussion of dynamics of a rotating body, it will be helpful at this juncture to draw analogy with linear motion. Recall that in linear motion, work is the energy transferred to or from an object via the application of a force along its displacement. Conversely, one can then say that force is the amount of work it does as it acts through a given displacement. In the dynamics of rotation, let us then invent an analogous quantity for rotation called torque, which bears the same relationship to angular motion as force does to linear motion. In this spirit, the torque can then formally be defined as the amount of work done in turning an object by an infinitesimal angle theta. 
Thus, the torque is a rotary or twisting force. With this definition of torque, it is quite straightforward to derive an expression for the torque of a point particle. The general expression for the torque is given by the cross product of its displacement and force. Feel free to pause the video if you would like to inspect the derivation. Otherwise, let's continue with the analogy. We recall that force can also be defined as the rate of change of linear momentum. This is the well known Newton's second law of motion. So a natural thing to do is to also introduce an analogous momentum for rotation, known as angular momentum herein denoted as L. Since torque tau is analogous to force F and angular momentum L is to linear momentum P, then tau can also be defined as the rate of change of L. Thus we have two definitions for torque. The left equation is inspired by the Newton's second law of linear motion, and the right equation was inspired by the definition of work done in linear motion. We can work the right expression, invoking Newton's second law and replacing force with the rate of change of linear momentum and get it in the form as shown. Then comparison of the expressions for the two torques, then allow us to arrive at the well-known equation for angular momentum, L equals to the cross product of the displacement vector and linear momentum. Using this expression, the total angular momentum for a given rigid body is then the sum of the angular momentum of all point masses. The expression highlighted in green can be viewed as the Newton's second law for angular momentum. In the absence of any externally applied torque, the total angular momentum must then be conserved. The rigid body will continue in its angular motion defined by L, unless acted upon by an external torque. Worth repeating, this equation is also known as the Newton's second law for angular motion. A great classroom demo of this principle is outlined in Feynman textbook. Here the wheel is analogous to an external torque. When the wheel is flipped, the applied external torque changes sign. This change in external torque would goes into imparting a change in total angular momentum of the instructor, causing him to rotate. A very neat experiment indeed to do in any classroom setting. Next, let's turn to the famous gyroscope. Here the spinning wheel produces an angular momentum that is keeping the gyroscope upright. If you observe carefully, you will see that the gyroscope is also processing about the vertical axis. Now if we place the gyroscope like this, then the precession becomes very apparent. During precession, the axis of the spinning object describes a cone in space. Then you might ask why wouldn't gravity cause it to topple? Now, let's unravel the physics behind precession. The precession implies that the angular momentum vector L is changing with time and from what we learned, there must be an external torque driving this change in momentum. What is it? First, we note the gravitational force acting at the center of mass. The force produces a torque as given by the displacement vector to the center of mass cross product with the gravitational force. It is this torque that caused the change in total angular momentum. The manner of precession depends on the sign of angular momentum. In other words, clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. So if we want a larger precession rate, should we spin the wheel faster or slower? Take a minute and think about this. The answer is a slower spinning wheel leads to a faster precession. Drop a comment if you need me to elaborate on this. Gyroscopic effect is also responsible for the balancing of bicycle. Check out this video by Minute Physics to find out more. All right, what's next? Let's continue with more analogies with Feynman since it's been quite fruitful thus far. Consider the definition of linear momentum given by the product of its mass and velocity. For the mapping from linear to angular motion, the linear momentum maps onto angular momentum while the linear velocity onto angular velocity. Then, there should be a quantity that is analogous to mass in angular motion. Since mass is also known as inertia, let's denote this quantity as the moment of inertia I. 
Previously, we derived the expression for the angular momentum given by the cross product of the displacement vector with linear momentum. With simple algebra, it is straightforward to derive an expression for the angular momentum in terms of the angular frequency, omega. Feel free to pause here if you would like to inspect the math. With this, the total moment of inertia is then the product of the mass times the distance from the axis squared, summed over all point masses. Let's ponder on what this expression for moment of inertia means. It says that a body has inertia for turning, and that depends not just on the mass, but how far away they are from the axis of rotation. Consider an ice skater with extended arms spinning with an angular speed of omega. Let us denote her moment of inertia as I. By closing in her arms, she reduced her moment of inertia. However, angular momentum L must be conserved. This then implies that the angular velocity omega must increase. This is the physics behind the ice skater dazzling spin. Another cool classroom demonstration of the moment of inertia is that of a contractible cage as shown. Again, reduction of the moment of inertia by collapsing the cage causes it to rotate faster so as to conserve the angular momentum. Since the moment of inertia is analogous to mass, let's follow Feynman and take the analogy a step further and define the rotational kinetic energy. By mapping the linear velocity to angular velocity and mass to moment of inertia, we arrive at the expression for the rotational kinetic energy given by half times I times omega square. Conservation of energy and rotational motion exhibit similar conservation principles to those in linear motion. The conservation of energy in rotational systems is described through terms like kinetic energy, potential energy, and rotational inertia. For example, the work done in pulling the string will then translate into rotational kinetic energy of the spinning top. Hold on, we are not done yet. The most interesting phenomena of angular motion are up next. So far we discuss rotation in the so-called inertia frame. Things start to get peculiar when you are in the rotating frame instead. Let's take the roller coaster as an example. From the perspective of the person outside the roller coaster, or the so called inertia frame, the people in the cart is going on a circular path, thus, there must be a centripetal force directed towards the center. However, from the perspective of the person in the cart, or what we call the rotating frame, he clearly feels a force pushing him outwards away from the center. This familiar force is known as the centrifugal force. This centrifugal force can even keep the popcorn in the bag. Intuitively, the origin of the centrifugal force can be understood as the tendency of the object to resist any change in its path of inertia. Certainly, the centrifugal force is real from the perspective of the person in the rotating frame, and we feel it in our car when it makes a sharp turn. So, we feel it, but can we mathematically derive the form of the centrifugal force? Let's start with the red point mass in a rotating disk. In the inertia frame as shown, the point mass dynamics is governed by the Newton's second law. It is given by force equals to mass times its acceleration. Now, instead of the inertia frame, we have a frame of reference that is also rotating at the same angular frequency as the disk. What would be the equivalent Newton's second law in this new rotating frame? In this new rotating frame, the time derivative operator will take a different form as shown, which has an extra term accounts for the base vectors rotating at angular frequency omega. The subscript I and R denotes the inertia and rotating reference frames. If one derives the acceleration in this rotating frame, which is just the second time derivative of the position vector R, one can show the appearance of three new terms, in addition to the actual physical force. In other words, the Newton's second law in the rotating frame is not simply just force equals to mass times acceleration. These new forces are also known as apparent forces, since they arise only in the non-inertial rotating frame. An observer in the rotating frame would thus experience these forces, here and known as the Coriolis, centrifugal and Euler forces. First, let's inspect the centrifugal force, which is proportional to omega cross omega cross r. 
For the red point mass, the displacement vector r is as shown. Since omega is pointing out of the page, omega cross r should then points upwards as shown. The centrifugal force given by omega cross omega cross r would thus points outwards away from the center in a manner directly opposite to the centripetal force in the inertia frame. Next up, we have the so-called Coriolis force. This apparent force shows up only if the red point mass is moving. And the Coriolis force is always directed transverse to its velocity as shown. From classical Newtonian mechanics, we know that such transverse force works to curve the particle trajectory. We see the Coriolis effect in action on Earth due to its rotation about its axis every day. Note the axis of Earth rotation is pointing from the south to north pole. For the northern hemisphere, it rotates counterclockwise with respect to the north pole. Consider a projectile launched at the equator moving longitudinally towards the north pole. Instead of traversing in a straight path towards the north pole, the projectile will be deflected towards the right due to the Coriolis effect as shown. The Coriolis effect is most apparent in the path of an object moving along the longitudes. For the southern hemisphere, since the Earth rotation is clockwise, the deflection of the projectile fired towards the south pole will be to the left instead. Thus, for long-range missile systems, or those with high velocities, failing to account for the Coriolis effect can lead to inaccuracies in targeting. The Coriolis effect also plays a crucial role in the development and behavior of hurricanes. Consider a local region of low atmospheric pressure. As the air converges towards the low pressure center, the Coriolis effect causes the incoming air to be deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. This deflection influences the rotation direction of large-scale weather systems, including hurricanes. For the northern hemisphere, the hurricane rotates counterclockwise. For hurricanes in the southern hemisphere, the Coriolis effect causes deflection to the left instead. Thus, the storms swirl clockwise in the southern hemisphere instead. Lastly, the Coriolis force is a maximum at the poles and zero at the equator. Now we are down to the last of these three apparent forces, the Euler force. The Euler force is finite only when there is a change in the angular frequency. For example, when we start spinning the disk, the angular frequency accelerates and the Euler force acts in the azimuthal direction in opposition to the increase in angular frequency. On the other hand, when the angular frequency decelerates, the Euler force acts in the opposite direction. Thus, the Euler force will be felt by a person riding a merry-go-round. As the ride starts, the Euler force will be the apparent force pushing the person to the back of the horse. And as the ride comes to a stop, it will be the apparent force pushing the person towards the front of the horse. Thank you for watching. Hope this helps in giving you a bird's eye view of the classical physics of angular motion and that the many real-life examples also help developing your intuition in this topic. See you next time.